Meyer, uh, and we'll speak about uh, constraining jet mechanisms with Fermi. All right, uh, I just want to say thank you to the organizers for uh, giving me this talk, uh, especially because this is, uh, this is some work that I've been doing recently um, that I think is very interesting, but it takes a little while to unfold and kind of give the whole picture, so I'm happy not to have to give a really, really lightning fast version of it. Um, this, is, um, this is a project I've actually been working on since my grad student days off and on, um, mostly with my main collaborator, Marcos Georgianopoulos, uh, but also with my most recent postdoc advisor, Bill Sparks, Eric Perlman, Netta Simijanowska, and also uh, Leith and Jim, who I unfortunately don't have pictures of. Um, so I usually don't like to start a long talk without at least one slide kind of discussing motivation. So why are we still studying jets in 2015? Usually we break that down into a couple of ways of thinking about it. First, jets is interesting physical laboratories. I mean, we are still studying supermassive black holes, and we don't really understand exactly why they sometimes produce jets. Um, and also, of course, now it's more in vogue to think of jets as possibly being key players in uh, galaxy evolution and feedback and uh, possibly playing a role there. Um, we know, we see very clearly um, evidence from these beautiful bubbles that jets blow into galaxy, hot galaxy uh, X-ray gas, um, that they are obviously heating up and dumping energy into their immediate environments. This includes um, galaxy scale effects where you see you know, gas cleared out of a galaxy. Um, and cluster scale effects. I'm not going to talk about these things like I normally do because I saw that you guys had a really nice review talk on Monday about it, so I'm just skipping over that. Um, so we're still really at the point of deciding how important jet mode feedback is, um, but either way, it's usually put into these, these galaxy evolution, universe evolution models kind of by hand. It's just sort of stuck in there. And we're not, um, we're not really at a point where we can say quantitatively um, really understand how, how much energy these jets are actually putting into their environments. So really what we want is we want to start I, this is a rather a crude way of expressing it, but we really want to know what the power of these jets is doing over time, for how long, um, and we kind of want to get the integral of that, right? Um, so let's see if I can. So uh, when it comes to jets, of course, there's still almost an embarrassing number of unknowns that we, we still haven't quite figured out um, in terms of getting into the more quantitative estimates of how jets impact their environments. Um, one of the things we don't have a very good handle on is speeds on kiloparsec scales. We have wonderful VLBI data sets showing us the speeds on parsec scales. Um, I have a small advertisement for some work that I've recently done. Um, we are getting some data using optical proper motions with HST. This is a recent result um, in the nearby radio galaxy 3C264 where we took 20 years of HST imaging, lined it all up very nicely, um, and we found that this is basically another M87. So the first knot here, knot A, is not moving at all. It's exactly like HST1. It's almost exactly the same distance from the core. The second knot is moving along at about 7C. It's slamming into a slower moving knot at 2C just downstream. And then the final, final knot actually shows a speed of 0C. So it's, you see the whole deceleration envelope, everything. So it's, it's a lot like M87, except it's a little more exciting because we have this, this active collision going on. This was good enough to get into a nature paper earlier this year. Um, so you can go check that out. So we are currently looking, oops, currently looking at about a dozen or so nearby sources with HST where we can really use this 20-year uh, timeline of HST observations to look for proper motions. This still only gives us a lower limit on the jet speed, but if, you, if you're observing something that looks like it's going seven times the speed of light, it has to be at least that fast, right? Um, so we are getting somewhere with speeds on kiloparsec scales, and there are prospects for more in the future. Um, but getting back to, to the list of unknowns, um, we still don't know exactly how the energy is partitioned between magnetic field and particles. And we like to say it's equipartition, but the truth is we could go in order of magnitude, maybe two off of that, and still be more or less consistent with observations in some cases. Um, we don't know the matter content of the jet, um, so we don't know how many protons are there. That can wildly affect your, your uh, energy estimates. Um, and in some cases, such as we'll discuss today, we're still back at square one of even understanding what radiation signature we're looking at. Um, so as I said, I'm skipping over kind of the jets and wider impact review stuff since you guys already had that. I did want to highlight some recent work um, by Chris Fromer, Avery Broderick, and Philip Chang, and a few others on TEV heating by jets, because I think this is sort of a, a storyline that hasn't been uh, as widely circulated as maybe it should be. Um, and these guys were motivated in part by the lack of the expected GEV halos around TEV blazers. So TEV blazers are these low-power blazers that, that give you TEV uh, emission. And they said, well, TV, the universe is, of course, opaque to TEV photons generally. Um, so these should be giving you inverse Compton cascades and showing up as a GEV bump. 
Um, and people have been looking for this. This is an example from a paper in 2010. So this is this thick line is what they were expecting to see in the GEV spectrum. And this is the Fermi upper limits, this concave line. So they're not seeing it. Um, that can be explained by a strong intergalactic magnetic field, which bends the, the light out of our line of sight. Um, but there starts to be other constraints which make that also not really work very well, such as basically um, these GV photons should still show up in the uh, extragalactic background, and they're not really showing the right profile. That's a, um, there's, a, there's a series of papers by these authors that you can check out if you're interested in that. So they, they were motivated by this problem to come up with um, an alternative, which is that you basically have a really uh, highly collimated beam of TeV photons in these sources. And they said, well, maybe there's extra plasma physics. So maybe there's oblique mode instabilities that are growing and actually saturating and, and overtaking this inverse Compton cascade effect and explaining why it never happens. Um, and they get some really nice, interesting results. They're able to explain a lot of kind of niggling problems, like uh, why there's all these missing dwarf satellites compared to simulations. Um, it's because they basically can suppress the dwarfs. Um, it alleviates the need for a very differently evolved population that basically only exists now and, and going back um, to the heyday of quasars doesn't exist at all. Um, they can also explain the inverted IGM temperature density profile, and you can find all this stuff in Chang 2012. So why am I highlighting this? Um, that's because um, I'm going to give you a spoiler of what I'm going to talk about today, which is that I'm finding that quasar jets, so not TEV BLX, but quasar jets, the ones that you usually don't think of as giving you TEVs at all, actually may be outproducing TEV BLX in total TEV production. And so we come back to thinking about all these things that TEV heating might be doing um, with a population that's much more numerous and we know um, goes back to higher redshifts. So that's why I'm um, highlighting that and I'll come back to it. Um, so I want to sort of start with a little history lesson. Some of you, I know that there are people in this room who've worked on this for much longer than I have and spent many more hours on it. So this is really for the people who have not worked on this problem. Um, so the rise of the inverse Compton model for X-rays from large scale jets. So the, the history starts in July 99 when Chandra was launched. They decided to focus the telescope on a nice, well-behaved point source, Park 0637. And unfortunately, it was not a nice, well-behaved point source. In addition to the core, there was this thing sticking out that turned out to be exactly where the radio jet is. Um, and that was not expected. Um, and the reason that wasn't expected is that Park 067 is your typical powerful quasar. Okay, so M87, sources like this, these low power jets, they will give you some x-rays because they'll basically be giving you the tail of the synchrotron spectrum in the jet. Um, and in the case of sources like Park 0637, we already know that this synchrotron spectrum is turning over in the optical. It's, it's rapidly dying, so there was no reason to expect this X-ray point. It was, it was very unexpected. Um, so that was kind of shocking, um, and it, but it was only one case, so people thought maybe it was just something really strange happening. Um, the, in the original discovery papers, they managed to rule out thermal Bremsstrahlung, synchrotron self-Compton, inverse Compton off the CMB, and obviously a single synchrotron spectrum to explain uh, this, this high X-ray flux. Sometimes I'll call these the anomalous X-ray sources. Um, they considered a second co-spatial synchrotron spectrum that basically would be a second population of electrons giving you higher energy synchrotron. Um, but it didn't make a lot of sense because why would it be there, basically? We don't have any theoretical models that predict that. Um, so not very long, this all happened kind of in rapid succession, um, not very long after the discovery, Tavecchio and Chiladi kind of concurrently just, just came up with the ICCMB model that does work for this. Um, and the idea was that these jets, like Park 0637, have very fast VLBI speeds on the Parsec scale. So something like 15C, 18C, um, they're very fast. So obviously their, their Lorentz factors are something like 10, 15. Um, and the conventional wisdom had always been that these things slow down by the kiloparsec scale, and they're only mildly relativistic, and that was based on uh, mostly radio surveys. And they said, well, what if we just say that it didn't slow down by then? It's still going fast. Um, then you have much more beaming of your ICCMB spectrum, and you can hit these X-ray points. So this is the plot from Chiladi 2001, where they very nicely reproduce. They have a synchrotron spectrum hitting the radio and optical, and this is the the inverse Compton spectrum explaining the x-rays very nicely. Um, and this, this model really took off, especially as Chandra kept discovering these things. So these anomalous x-ray sources, it wasn't a one-off. There were dozens. Um, and here's just one I randomly pulled from the literature, Park 0723, where again you have these knots that clearly the optical is way down here and the x-ray is up here. So you have to have a second emission component to explain it. 
Um, so many, many more of these the cases and many people, um, probably I did not list them all, who have been working on this. There's a nice review by Harrison Krasinski in 2006, but also Herman Marshall, Simbruna, Jorstad and Marster, uh, Preeti has worked on these, um, and other people. So there's lots and lots of cases where, for the most part, ICCMB is the most pleasant, easy to apply model to explain why we have these really high X-ray fluxes. Um, but doubts about the ICCMB model did sort of start creeping in. Um, one of the first things that people noticed was that these jets tended to have a radio to X-ray uh, flux ratio that flipped from beginning to end of the jet. So as you go out in the jet, the X-rays are dying and the radio is coming up. Um, but that was, that was worked in. So people said, OK, there's some kind of uh, gradual deceleration of the flow. Uh, Marcos Yorganopoulos worked on this and uh, Hardcastle uh, wrote a nice paper in 2006 really examining this. Um, and you can still make it work. Um, but there were other issues. So we still have problems with ICCMB requiring near or super Eddington jets in some cases. And that's because you basically have an electron energy distribution that has to be extended down to very low energies um, to make those x-rays. Um, the small beaming angle that's required. So you, you really have to really boost your beaming to the maximum possible level, so which requires small angles to line of sight. Sometimes this gives you unrealistic things, like jets that are three or four or five megaparsecs long, which starts to get uncomfortably longer than the things we actually see in the plane of the sky. Um, in general cases, the ICCMV fit is often an uncomfortable one. So not explicitly ruled out, but you're starting to get into weird parts of the parameter space. Um, and plenty of people have pointed out that a second synchrotron spectrum explaining those x-rays has not really been ruled out um, and may be more reasonable. Um, and I mentioned here only briefly that hadronic models are also a rather underexplored possibility. The essential problem basically for the last 15 years is that we keep discovering these things and modeling them and we don't have any way from radio, optical, and x-ray data to differentiate between an ICCMB model and a double synchrotron model. You can fit your sparse data points pretty equally well between the two. Um, in, in rare cases, perhaps it, you won't be able to fit an ICCMB model because your X-ray spectrum is too flat or something like that. But for the most part, a lot of these sources could really go either way. So this is a, an example, Parks 1136-135 um, from CARE et al. 2013, uh, where they do they show exactly that. Coincidentally, this source was actually ruled out as an ICCMB um, model source in a kind of unique way, which is that these UV points here turn out to be really highly polarized, which is not consistent with ICCMB. Um, but that's not an easy way to test most of these, because in almost every case, this first synchrotron component is still dominating in the, in the UV. Um, so back in 2006, uh, Marcos Yorganopoulos came up with a, a possible test for to really differentiate between these two models. And it's it should mention that it's not a small difference between them. You have huge differences in the amount of uh, total power in the jet. Um, you're really, uh, you're, the, the physical parameters, descriptions are quite different. You know, the angle of the line of sight, the jet length, all of that. Um, so it's not, it's not some minor detail of how the jets work. Um, and what he noticed uh, was that the, the ICCMB spectrum that you get, that, so in this case, here's the synchrotron spectrum is the black curve, here's your X-ray points, and the red curve here is an ICCMB spectrum. It's basically, you can think of it as a copy of the synchrotron spectrum shifted to higher frequencies and up and down in luminosity, parameterized exactly by B over delta, the magnetic field over the Doppler factor, and no other free parameters. Okay, so the shape is pretty much fixed from your synchrotron spectrum. Um, so that means there's exactly one B over delta so here's B over delta too low, B over delta too high, Goldilocks. There's exactly one B over delta that hits your X-ray point. So if you want ICCMB to explain your X-rays, then you've really kind of frozen this whole <coughs> SED to a certain level. And of course, the thing that stuck out like a sore thumb is that you're predicting this monstrous amount of GeV emission. Okay, so these blue lines are roughly the Fermi energy band limits. Um, so this was back in 2006 before Fermi was called Fermi, it was called GLAST, it hadn't launched yet. Um, and he wrote a prediction that maybe we'd be able to nail this down. It turns out to be a little bit more difficult than that. Um, resolution is an issue, right? So most of these large-scale jets um, are a few arc seconds, maybe tens, hundreds of arc seconds at most from the core, and uh, the, the Fermi PSF is much, much larger than that. Um, and of course, they have really bright cores that give you plenty of gamma ray emission from IC, uh, not from ICCMB, from, from CMB, or sorry, from inverse Compton. Um, 
Anyway, so, uh, so this was an issue for a while, and um, during graduate school, I was actually spending a lot of time looking at light curves like this. This is 3C273's light curve. Here's the first year of the Fermi mission, second year, third year, fourth year. Um, and I was basically waiting for the core to go quiet, because I figured if the core would go quiet, possibly this ICCMB spectrum would be sticking up like a little flag, right? Because it actually should be a pretty hard spectrum. It should be non-variable completely. Um, so I was basically just waiting for this to go down. Um, and what we ended up doing was we waited quite a bit longer than the first two years I started looking at this, about five years, and finally the core did go quiescent. So here's a bunch of upper limits here. And we stacked up uh, all the observations from when the core was giving us upper limits, and we got basically some deep upper limits. So these are deep upper limits on both the core and the large-scale jet, because if it was sticking up like a flag, we would have actually detected it. And what we found, simply enough, is that these Fermi limits clearly rule out ICCMB. So if you want to match these x-rays here, you're predicting this level of GEV emission and these upper limits rule it out. And there's really not any free parameters that you can twiddle with to try to get away from that. Um, interestingly, uh, 373 I'm also looking at as part of our proper motions work with HST. Um, so I am going to kind of jump and show another way that you can rule out ICC and B using a completely different set of observations. So um, this is the jet in 1995 taken with WIFPIC2, this is the jet in 2003, um, and then we got a recent epic in 2014. And if it looks like nothing has changed in this picture, it's because nothing changed in this picture. So absolutely nothing. Not the flux, not a single knot moved. Um, we're getting upper limits on the order of 1C for knot A, slightly larger for some of the dimmer knots. Um, but we're taking 1C as basically the upper limit for any proper motions in this jet. So that's a problem for the ICCMB model because it actually predicts that the knots should be moving <laughs> Um, probably with a speed of about 10 C if you want to be an equipartition. You can try to lower that by getting away from equipartition, uh, but then you start getting energetically disfavored. So um, this seems to kind of confirm that basically ICCMB is not working for this source. Um, but you might be okay with that because a lot of people doubted that 3C73 ever was an ICCMB source because of the weird way the spectrum was changing as it was going out. Um, so we kept looking for more sources to do this on, and the next one we attacked was the original. This is Park 0637, the nice, ill-behaved point source that started the whole problem. Um, and we basically did the same thing, and we found the same thing, which is that if you want to hit these X-ray flux points, um, you overproduce the GEV limits. <coughs> so ICCMB is ruled out at something like the 99.99% level. Um, so. That's one takeaway from, from this body of research. It's two sources plus the third source that was ruled out by UV polarization uh, for this model, um, which means that we're basically back at basically looking at a second synchrotron component. There's, it's basically a process of elimination at this point. So we're left with a second synchrotron component, which is rather mysterious. We, the reason nobody liked that model in the beginning is that we don't have any, you know, we don't have any obvious mechanism for producing a second synchrotron component exactly co-spatial uh, with, it, with the first one that peaks in the infrared. Um, so if you're a theorist and you want to think about why we would get that in these jets, um, now, now would be a good time to think about it. Um, so the other interesting thing that um, comes out from this is that ICCMB is not the correct explanation for the x-rays, but that doesn't mean that it isn't a useful model. It must happen at some level. We know that these jets are at least mildly relativistic because they're one-sided. Um, and we see that the, even the hot spots are somewhat beamed. Um, so basically what we're finding is that there's a maximum level of emission which is just barely um, under these limits, which corresponds to a certain B over delta level. Um, so if you assume equipartition values of magnetic field, you can actually get a limit on the Doppler factor, which is not something that's very easy to get a limit on. Um, so that's another game that we've started playing with these sources, which is basically using the Fermi limits to keep pushing down the Doppler factor of these jets. Um, so I'm going to actually skip this slide and go to the next one since I have five minutes. Um, so here's, this is a rather complicated set of plots for 373 on the left and Park 0637 on the right. What I want to focus on is just the gray shaded area. So this is actually the beaming corrected isotropic emission from the knots. We just summed all the knots up. We said it's synchrotron emission from radio to optical to the second X-ray bump. Um, and the reason that it's this range is because we still don't know exactly what the Doppler factor is. It has to be at least two-ish. Um, and in this case, in 373, we think it's less than about eight. In Park 067, I think it's less than about 6.5. Um, 
And the interesting thing is that if you have X-rays that are from synchrotron, then they must inverse Compton scatter up to TeV energies. Okay, so that's what this light blue shaded region is showing you, is basically the region of ICCMB that must come from this gray shaded region. In both cases, we're looking at the total isotropic emission. Okay. Um, the actual beamed and detectable by a detector would be somewhere up here by around, between 10 to the minus 12, 10 to the minus 13, most likely. Um, it turns out that for both these cases, that's not probably something we're going to detect with something like CTA in the TEV range. We might be able to pick up this slight upturn at the uppermost Fermi band energies if these jets are almost as relative, almost uh, fast enough to basically produce the ICCMB we want to see in Fermi. Um, so I'm circling in red this, this level of TEV emission. And that's because if you look at the, the new all new here, we're looking at something between 10 to the 42 and 10 to the 43 isotropic. Okay, that's one to two orders of magnitude brighter than what you expect from your typical TEV BLAC once you correct for beaming. Um, so surprisingly, and I think something that hasn't been realized before, quasar jets, which are not thought of as TEV emitters, are possibly giving us monstrous load of TEV photons. Naturally, these are gonna pair produce and go off and do something else. Um, and that's why I was highlighting at the beginning um, all these interesting findings with TV heating from, from TV BLX, because I think this will be a more interesting population in the end than the TV BLX. So the consolation prize for not getting, not detecting ICCMB, which is what I actually started out this whole project to do, I was sure it was the right model and I was sure we were gonna detect it, um, is at least that we get this interesting consequence that the slower the jets are, the more TV emission we get. Um, so TV heating is no longer limited to the relatively no, low number density and possibly negatively evolving TV BLX. Um, if the plasma beam instabilities are not as efficient as calculated by the promeral group, and you should definitely pay attention to Soroni and Yanos, who say it's about 100 times lower than these guys are claiming, um, the cumulative effect of all those quasar jets may actually still be enough to compensate. Um, so we may still have interesting um, effects from this population. Um, of course, we know that this population goes up to high redshifts, very high redshifts. ICCMB goes as 1 plus e to the 4th, so interesting heating effects in the early universe. Um, stuff to be investigated. Okay, so next, we're basically taking this Fermi test to expand it from more than a sample of two, hopefully to a couple dozen, uh, much higher redshift samples. So hopefully we will, in fact, detect ICCMB, even if it doesn't explain the x-rays. Um, oops. So that, I want to just jump to the takeaway. So... ICCMB is not the cause of the anomalously high X-rays in 3673, 0637, and 1136. If you want to be pessimistic, you can stop there. I think that this is likely going to be true for most of our low redshift sample. Maybe not at high redshift, right, because the, IC, uh, the CMB is enhanced as you go back. Um, we still have an interesting mystery on our hands, which is where do these second synchrotron uh, electrons come from? Why is it cospatial? Why does it usually die as you go out along the jet? This is a mystery for theorists to look at. Um, kiloparsec scale jets are not, after all, super fast. This is actually kind of reassuring because it fits with the other lines of evidence we had from radio surveys. They're probably mildly relativistic. We still see one-sided jets, et cetera. Um, I'll make a prediction that Fermi <coughs> will detect ICCMB before the 10-year mission is up. Um, it has to be there at some level, um, and I think we'll find it. And it does give us direct measurements of V over delta. Um, the synchrotron X-rays should give us loads of TEV emission, almost certainly more than the TEV blazer class in total luminosity. This may turn out to be capital letters really important. And uh, finally, another prediction, either Fermi or CTA will finally detect this upturn uh, in, the, in the high energy that's gonna actually confirm that these X-rays are synchrotron. So, um, and this is just uh, follow-up work where we're looking at variability in the X-rays, these other sources that I already mentioned, and I'll just leave it at that. I think I'm out of time. All right, very good, thank you. Questions? Let's see up here. Uh, over there. <laughs> Whoever has a microphone. Yeah. Yeah, I have a, one comment and a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. One thing is that your ICCMB model, the rule, you said that what are the possible, in the, I think, possibly third or fourth slide. One more important observation which you question the ICCMA model is the size of the knot. Because if you see the, the energy of the electrons, 
which is emitting X-ray by ICCMB process, or the same population which emits radio. Mm -hmm. So typically, your X-ray not size should be in a comparable with the radio. Yes. All right. So that is the one observational thing which was again questioned the ICCMP model. Yeah. And the question I have is that, so when you have done that uh, Fermi upper limit, so you have subtracted the whenever the core flare, core is flare, you take a when the core is quiescent, right? Mm -hmm. So that reduces your time of your integration time. So maybe I'm not I'm not sure I may be wrong, but you need to have some uh, to integrate over a longer time to find the Fermi upper limit. Am I right? Uh, it's, you end up integrating for a couple of years total. It's, it goes quiet for a yeah, long because time. Because the flux level is... We're talking the upper. I didn't focus on that, but I'm actually looking at the highest Fermi bands. The low energy bands are contaminated very quickly with, with the core. Um, yeah, the Fermi the flux level is, is very, very low. Soft. Yeah, the flux level is at minus 12, minus 12, minus 13. Yeah, That's yeah, what I was yeah, questioning. Yeah. Um, okay. This is at like 3 to 10 GeV, so pretty high energy. Right. And the right. other um, thing is your, uh, the other question I had is that your, uh, the Doppler factor upper limit you are quoting a 6.7 and this other number, mm -hmm. there is a one with parameter, which is not a parameter actually, the radius of the size of the region. Correct. Yeah, you have to assume so, a magnetic field. Which right, right. So the normally we take the radio not, si not size, yes. but the dependence of the delta with the radius is so sharp, you take it by a factor of two, the delta goes up drastically. Yeah, In fact, it, I is, tried it, yeah. it is unfortunately sensitive. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, let's have another question over here. I think, um, Denise. Thank you. Um, I, I just I didn't quite catch. I mean, this this idea that the you need slow jets to get TEV emission is really intriguing because that's supposedly been a mystery mm -hmm. um, as to why that the sources that have the most TEV emission seem to have um, low superluminal speeds and so forth. But I mean, can you just in a nutshell kind of explain that physically why that's happening? I, I didn't catch that. Okay. Well, I was being a bit glib, but uh, basically because they are slow and cannot give you X-rays by ICCMB. So the fact that we don't have these super fast ICCMB jets, I was saying as compensation, slow jets at least give us TEV emission. So I don't. I didn't no, mean to. Why, connect I don't understand you. why slow jets give TEV emission in the picture you're looking at. Uh, yeah, because the X-rays are synchrotron, basically. Okay, so you, you're saying that they, the X-rays must be synchrotron. Yes. And therefore, they will get upscattered. They will get upscattered. Okay, they must. You. Yes. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, thank no, you two, again. Two more questions. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm afraid time's up. So there's one very important thing I have to say. You mentioned that the optical state at two energy, but I thought you mentioned you know, operation by magnetism of 1.44. Yes. Yes, that is also a concern. So that means yeah. the whole universe is open to us at 500. Yes. Very important. Yeah. All right, well, thanks again, Eileen. Mm -hmm.